Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Sandy, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Hi. Now, with my pager that went off, it's work, okay? I'm supposed to call him back, but I'm going to let it slide for a while. Um, this is the worst case of cotton mouth I've ever had. Oh my God, I'm so nervous. I can't believe it. Um, I guess I should be grateful I'm not the 45 minute speaker. I'm 15 minutes is enough for me. And um, I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about where I came from, um, what Sandy's all about, and what Alcoholics Anonymous has done for me. I've been sober now for a little bit over three years, and my life is 110% better since I've been here, and I can honestly say that. Um, my story is a lot about isolation. Um, I hear a lot of people chair, and I hear about a lot of the DUIs and losing homes and losing jobs and losing families, husbands, wives, kids, all that good stuff. I was fortunate enough not to have that happen to me. I didn't lose a lot of material things during my drinking, but I lost my soul. I lost my identity and I never knew what Sandy was all about. Um, I started drinking at the age of 15, and I drank for 10 years. Um, Again, drinking was social, it was fun, it was a way for me to fit in with people. I always felt like a misfit. Um, I was teased a lot in high school and junior high. I had, I was real skinny, I had glasses, I had braces, I was real thin. I had I wore floods, you know, so, I mean, kids can be really cruel, and um, I never seemed to fit in, and when I was in junior high, um, I started drinking and smoking cigarettes um, as a way to kind of conform with uh, the burnouts, if you guys know what I mean. I couldn't stand the cheerleaders, okay, I couldn't fit in with them, I wasn't a straight-A student, um, I'm smart, but I didn't want to be associated with those type of people. So I started cutting class and hanging out in the parking lot and wearing real cool clothes and uh, dealing drugs and drinking a lot. And slowly I got invited to a lot of after-school parties and I started dating and I started getting a crowd of people around me and I felt like, hey, this is it, you know, I I belong. After high school, um, drinking got progressive and my story, the progressiveness of my disease is that it brought me to isolation, it brought me to paranoia, and it brought me to be really fearful of people. Um, again, you know, I started drinking when I was 15 years old, and I think that, especially 13 to 15, that's when you're really getting to know what you're all about, and drinking really numbed me, and I never got to really grow and find out what Sandy is all about. After high school, um, I started drinking. I moved in with a girlfriend of mine, started drinking every other day. There's a Dire Straits song that's, that's out that I just love. It talks about when he's sober and it was the worst hangover he ever, he ever had, you know, and it's like, yeah, you know, it's like I would drink and then I would nurse the hangover the next day and then the next day I would get that incredible urge to drink and I would swear I would never drink and I went through all the things that everybody does. I would switch you know, what I was drinking, I'd switch the time of the day, who I drank with, where I drank with, and none of that seemed to work. I lived with a girlfriend, I was drinking every other day, I started drinking in my bedroom, okay, I started isolating because living with my girlfriend, I didn't want her to know how much I drank, I'd have a couple of beers with her, I'd have a six pack or a bottle of wine stash in my bedroom, and then I'd say, okay, I'll see you later, good night, and I'd go to my bedroom and continue to drink till I passed out. Now, a lot of patterns that happened while I was drinking in my teens, I could see a lot of the patterns when I was a child. Because when I was a child, I grew up in a family where my, I love my parents, man. They provided us with a really good environment. Um, however, it was a good environment. It was very platonic. You know, we never got angry. You know, I always wanted to live in an Italian family, you know. And we never laughed joyously or we never cried and really you know, shared our sorrow. It was just kind of like everything's okay, and if there's something wrong or if Sandy's wigging out or Renee's, you know, crying, it's just like we pretend like everything's okay. 
And so I never had a real good role model of how to express feelings. I was also a tantrum thrower and had a lot of anger when I was a child. And I didn't know how to relay this anger, so I would go in my bedroom and literally just tear my bedroom apart or isolate. And I lived in a real fantasy dream world, and that continued when I grew up. I would drink by myself, and I would live in a little fantasy world. And I would pretend like I was something that I was not. I eventually moved out from this girlfriend because I couldn't live with her anymore. Um, and then the last two years before I hit my bottom, I moved in by myself, I had a cat, and I drank every other day. And what happened for me was I started getting the paranoia. Um, I'm not talking about spiders crawling on the walls and stuff. I'm not talking about visionary paranoia. I'm talking about someone would say something to me and I would really take it the wrong way, you know. And I have a real good way of somebody saying something to me and I twist it around because they mean to really hurt me, you know. And it could be a compliment or it could be just, some, you know, being real direct to me. And I have this way of saying, they hate me, man, or they're out to get me, you know. It's, it's just a paranoia. Um, I was going to give you an example of my paranoia, but I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll tell you. My cat died, okay, when I was drinking, and it crushed me. I mean, this cat was my best friend. And all the neighborhood kids loved my cat, and they knew my cat got run over by a car, okay? And I remember hearing a chair of this lady who used to walk around in her bathroom, and I could totally relate. And uh, one afternoon after my cat had died, I had all the drapes shut, and the door was locked, and I was in my robe, and I was drinking my beer, and I was isolating, and, and I was mourning, and there was a knock on the door. You know, nobody ever comes over. And I opened up the door, and there were like six kids all looking up at me, you know, and I'm looking down at them, and they go, is Juniper here? And I'm like, they know the cat's dead. Why are they doing this to me? And I really just wigged out, you know, and I just looked at him. I'm like, you know, my cat's dead. You know, I'm just like, what are you guys doing? Why are you here? And I just slammed the door, and I just wigged out, you know. So I couldn't relate to people. I thought people were talking about me behind their backs. At work, I couldn't relate to a lot of people. Um, so I was very socially dysfunctional. Um, relationships, I I dated a lot. Um, I had one relationship where I was involved with a man for six years off and on, and it was a very platonic relationship. He, when I came to this program, he did not know I had a drinking problem, and I drank most of the time I was with this, with this man, and I did not know that he was addicted to cocaine. I mean, that's how blind we were. We were so involved in our own addiction, we didn't even know each other, you know, and um I always pick the men that didn't have a car, you know, or I always pick the men that um, had an ex-wife that was still in the picture or a wife or a girlfriend in the picture. And, you know, I tended to have these patterns where I wasn't the only female involved, you know, and I had real, so, you know, low self-esteem and unconsciously I was, you know, this pattern was going on for me. And, um, you know, I'm like, you know, damn it, how come I'm picking these men that, cannot be committed to a relationship. Why can't I just be the one woman in their life? Or how come, you know, this is such a platonic relationship? They're, you know, these men are um, fearful of intimacy. And what happened when I got in this program and after working the steps with a sponsor, you know, came to find out that I was the one who was afraid of the commitment and I was having fear of the intimacy. So that was a real awakening for me. All this time I blamed the men in my life, and lo and behold, it was me who was afraid. Um, I have a fiancé right now that calls me Sybil sometimes, and, and I take that very lightheartedly because it happens. Um, when I came in this program, I came in this program with a good drinking friend of mine, and she's in the program today, and I love her dearly. And we came in the program together, and it was kind of like the blind leaving the blind. Um, she came in, and I followed just because she was my friend, and it was something to do. Um, I did hit a bottom with alcohol. I knew I was an alcoholic. I knew a little bit about Alcoholics Anonymous, and I came in with my best drinking buddy, and it was a nice way to come into these rooms. And... Um, 
you know, I, I don't I don't think I need to tell you guys what a relief it is to explain that you're an alcoholic and get up in front of a group of people and, and claim that, you know, what a relief that is. And that happened to me. And um, I don't think I need to tell you guys how I felt when I was in it, when I came into this this room. Um, I was scared. Um, I was one of those ladies that walked in and smiled all the time and laughed and I'm fine and how are you? And then I made a beeline for the door. Um, um, it took me about four months in this program until I really got to break down and cry in, in a women's meeting. And thank God for women's meetings because that really allowed me to become myself. But for a long time, it was playing this great facade game. Um, I've always learned that this is what was taught to me and, and how I developed while I was drinking that I wanted to be what you wanted me to be. And I could be one way with one person and then two hours later be at work and be another way with another person and then three hours later be on a date and be another way with another person and I didn't know who the hell I was. And when I came into this room, I was so... What's the word? I wasn't comfortable in my own skin. I was squirrely. I thought I would just scream. I was jumpy. I was nervous. Um... And I still am today. I have those periods where I'm going through some growth and I don't know what I'm about and I'm going to be knowing what I'm about and I don't think I want to know what I'm about and I'm going crazy. And um, so he calls me Sybil because I go through these <laughs> these really weird phases. You know, I could be one way um, one minute and the next way another. And I have a real hard time with these split personalities and what I've come to realize from this program is that one is my recovery self and one is my alcoholic self and every single day I battle with these voices and um, like before I shared tonight you know I kind of thought in my head what I wanted to say and my recovery voice would go yeah yeah and then my alcoholic voice would go oh don't say that and I have these battles all the time and I don't know if you guys can relate to that or not but I am constantly having that alcoholic self trying to feed other shit into my brain and if I don't get to meetings and if I don't work the steps and my favorite is working one on one with an alcoholic I love having a sponsor and I love being a sponsor that's my favorite part then I go absolutely crazy um, this program has given me a lot of wonderful gifts. Um, I'm in a relationship right now, and he he's very grateful. He's a very grateful man, and that's wonderful to have someone like that in your life. I can choose who I like to be around today. I don't have to be in situations or with people that I don't want to be around. And he gives me a lot of support, and he makes me laugh at myself. Um, it's really nice to have humor today and to be able to laugh. When I think I'm in a crisis and when I think I'm going absolutely crazy, he'll mimic me or make fun of me and I'll laugh and, you know, I'll cry and it's like, you know what, it is okay. You know, let's be a little bit lighthearted here. And we're going to get married in October. And I was hardcore, you know. I, you know, thanks. <laughs> um, I was real hardcore when I came to this program. You know, I wanted to be like a biker lady you know I wanted to drive off in the sunset on a Harley and I wanted to be bad and I wanted to be hardcore it's serious nothing against you guys I'm serious and um I always looked down on women that you know went to these bridal showers and you know that wanted to get married and I'm like god give me a break don't you want to do anything else and you know what? Now it's like, I'm going to get married and that's a gift because you know what? I deserve it. And I do want that. And I want to have children. I want to be a mom, you know, and I want to be there for my family. Um, I have a sister and we are the best of friends today. And when I made my amends to her, which was one of the first amends I made, you know, I apologized. I said, you know what? I go, I did some really rotten things to you. We hated each other. And she turned around and looked at me and she goes, yeah, you know what? You did. And that was it. And you know what? We are the best of friends today. I love her a lot. She's going to be my maid of honor. And she's moving to Boston June 6th. And I think I'm going to cry. I mean, I'm going through abandonment. And I love her a lot. And my mom and dad are really supportive through this whole wedding thing. And they're proud of me. They, they can say that to me. And we have our ups and downs. But you know what? 
I can look at them and have a little bit more patience than I used to. Um, the big book was wonderful for me when I first came in the program, and then I started having these these voices in my head because my mom's a Baptist, and I was brought up that you don't worship any other book but the Bible. And I had these voices in my head telling me that. And I would go to people in the program and go, you know what, I really feel like I'm being brainwashed here. I did. I felt real comfortable with this guy, and I, I told him that. I go, I feel like I'm being brainwashed. And he just looked at me and said, well, you know what, my brain needs some washing. I don't know about yours. And he walked away, and I went, yeah, you know. You know, they're so blunt. And I learned when you first come in this program that if you ask someone who's been around here for a long time how they're doing, you better be ready to listen to them. Because now that I'm in the program for a while, it's getting easier and easier for me to share myself with others. And I learned that you've got to reach out, you have to be honest, and you've got to reveal yourself to others. Um, because if I isolated today, even though I'm in recovery, or if I didn't pick up that telephone and I didn't talk to meetings, because I'll tell you, Stan, I came up with a lot of <laughs> reasons not to come here tonight. If I didn't do this and show up, suit up and show up, I'd be right back out there. And there's no doubt in my mind. Um, and the beauty of this program is that if you stick around here long enough, and, you, and sometimes I'll have doubts that, you know, I'm just not getting it. You know, and I analyze the steps. I don't take the steps. I sit there and I analyze them and I pick them apart. Um, there's people that I had a wonderful experience. I went to... A friend of mine, I said, you know, I just don't feel like I'm getting it. And he looked at me and he put his arm around my shoulder. He goes, well, let me tell you about how you were when you first came in this program. And he told me. And you know what? It's like, yeah, I have come a long way. And we all need to pat ourselves on the back for being here tonight, you know. And uh, those one day at a time and live and let live, all those wonderful mottos, I, I clung on to those, man, my first 90 days. And that really helped me get through my program. And I have a wonderful relationship with a higher power. Um, I was I was revealed to religion during my childhood in high school. I was I belonged to uh, Young Life, which is a Christian youth group. And for me, I always had a higher power, even though I was drinking, because it was much easier for me to talk to a God that I could not see than to talk to another human being. So I already had that rapport going. Although my prayers were different than when they were what they are now, um, he's never left my side, you know. And I, I believe in a divine spirit. I believe in something guiding me. And I also believe that sometimes my, the simplest prayer that I can have for a day is, God, please open my heart and please open my ears and my eyes. Because a lot of times I'm so wrapped up into myself that I don't see God working through you people to show me the way. And I'm so into myself, or how I'm coming across, or, or how I am in a situation. I'm so self-involved that I can't see him talking through you to me. And I really believe that's how God works in this program. And I don't see the little miracles in front of me. Um, I'm really excited. It's kind of like ladies' night tonight. We have a wonderful 45-minute speaker next. And um, I'm really excited to get on with the birthday chips. And I just want to say this program works if you're here and you're new. Um, give it give it your best shot. I mean, there's no place to refer you to after after this. And um, I'm here to tell you that my life is beautiful, and I don't know what I'd do without Alcoholics Anonymous. And thank you for letting me speak tonight. Hello, my name is Amy. I'm an addict alcoholic. Hi. And I'm actually from Hollister. I just need to verify that. Um, I'd like to say happy birthday and congratulations to everybody who picked up a chip. I know for me that the feeling that I get when I pick up a chip is something I cannot put into words. Um, they're very, very important to my sobriety. And I'd also like to welcome all the newcomers that are here today. Um, you know, I don't know if you're in the right place, only you know that. But I know for me um, that it was the right place. You know, I guess what I'm going to do is share a little bit about where I came from, you know, what happened to me to get me here, and what's happened since I've been here. And, you know, I've been thinking back a lot, and I do this every time I'm around a birthday, and uh, I was thinking back to my childhood, and, and they talk about in these rooms, more will be revealed. I, and I started remembering my behavior and patterns before I ever took a drink. And, and before I ever took a drink or a drug, um, my behavior patterns were already alcoholic. You know, um, I had feelings and emotions that I did not know how to express. Um, my behavior was wrong. 
and I was also told it was wrong. I, I, I was in a household where, and, and for Sandy, if she's here or not, I was born and raised in an Italian Greek family, and it ain't fun, you know. Um, they yell a lot, <laughs> and they have massive tempers, you know. But uh, when I was little, I can remember feeling feelings and going to my parents with these feelings, and and I was always told to just be quiet. I, I can remember going to my father when I, I would get in trouble, see, and a lot of the times... I knew I did something wrong, but I didn't really know what I did, if that makes sense. You know, I knew what I had done that wasn't right, but I needed to talk about it. And, and I would go to my father and say, you know, I don't understand what's going on here. I need to talk. You know, I think you're wrong. And I was told, I'm right, you're wrong, go to your room. So I'd go to my room, you know, and, and I'd go to my room and I'd sit there and I'd wonder in confusion. And, and I'd sit there and I'd come back out and everything was just fine. And I was still confused, so I thought that I was different, that there was something wrong with Amy. You know, also in my family, when, when uh, I used to get yelled at a lot, um, I misbehaved a lot, and I got yelled at. And when I, when I got yelled at, I cried. You see, I'm real sensitive. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm real sensitive. And you yell at me and raise your voice, I will cry. You know, and, and I cried when I was a little girl, and that's normal. For me, it was normal. Little kids show their feelings, and they, and they express their emotions. And I would cry, and my father would look at me and say, if you don't stop crying, I'll give you something to cry about. Wow, you know, like I just totally got invalidated within 30 seconds. That what I was doing was not okay. That it wasn't okay to show feelings. That all that stuff wasn't okay. And, and I remember going into, you know, elementary school, and I got in trouble a lot in elementary school also. And it was because I didn't know how to express myself. See, when I would be playing handball and I was called out and I didn't like that, the only way I knew how to express myself was by hitting somebody. So I'd hit him, you know, and, and I gave him a black eye. <laughs> And I get called into the principal's office, you know, saying, what are you doing beating up on sixth graders when you're in third? You know, and, and I, I didn't know. I just knew that I was upset, but I didn't know what was going on with Amy. And um, my childhood was very good. I, I don't blame my disease on my parents. I do not come from a dysfunctional family, you know. Um, there were some things that happened in my household that were handed down to me, and it is now my responsibility, if I don't like them, to change that. It is not my parents' fault. You know, um, I had the disease way before I ever picked up a drink or a drug. And uh, my first experience with any of that was when I was about 12 or 13 years old and I was in junior high school. And, you know, in those years I was a tomboy. See, I, I didn't fit in with girls either, so I knew something was wrong with me. See, because girls played with dolls and I played football. You know, girls went and did their makeup and their hair, and, and I was fighting guys. So there was something wrong, you know. And... And I, was, I would call guys out at school. You know, if I didn't like the way I was being treated, I'll talk to you after school. You know, we, we'll deal with this. And, and it was pretty cool. My brother thought real highly of his little sister being able to kick the crap out of these kids, and especially men, you know, and little boys, you know. I was the terror in my neighborhood. All the guys hid from Amy, you know. And uh, so needless to say, I never got into a relationship. And... Um, <laughs> You know, when I got into junior high school, I still didn't feel right. I still didn't feel right. I still didn't feel like I fit in. But I did have a lot of guy friends, you know, once that they found out I wasn't going to kick their butt, we got along. And I, I started smoking weed, and, and I liked the effect. I liked the effect of what it did for me. And, and what I was taught when I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, that there needs to be one key point there for me to be an alcoholic or an addict. And what it needs to be is when I take that fix or pill or that drink, then it needs to make everything okay. And when I took that first toke off that joint, I was okay. You know, it, it didn't need no more. That, that's all it took for Amy, you know. And, and I started to smoke cigarettes, and, and I learned to lie, too. I learned that you lie about how you feel. At least for me, I lied about how I felt because it wasn't acceptable. Um, and, and, you know, I had fun for a while. I mean... Marijuana made me laugh, and it made me have the munchies, and it made it okay to eat the kind of food that I wanted to eat, like Oreo cookies and candy bars and potato chips and that kind of stuff, you know. And uh, I did that for a while, and I don't know what happened, but somewhere along the line while I was smoking that stuff, it made me feel weird. And it no longer made it okay. It made me feel as if I was in a different world, that nobody could touch me, and it scared me. And so it scared me, and I stopped. Just like that, I just stopped. You know, and, and I still smoke cigarettes. And, um, you know, in junior high school, I had my first experience with sex. 
and, and it wasn't my choice. Um, I was 13 years old, and, and I cut school with somebody that I trusted, and I got raped, you know. And, uh, I, oh, I was pissed. I was mad at him, you know. It was his fault. This should have never happened. Well, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I worked the 12 steps, and guess what? I have my partner. I'm not the victim today. You know what? If I didn't cut school and leave campus and do what I wasn't supposed to be doing, see, back then I, I had that God voice telling me, this is wrong. Don't do it. And every time I heard that voice, I did it anyway because I wanted to prove it wrong. And it always got me into trouble. And, uh, you know, I, I'm able to be to, to terms with what happened. And I don't hold any anger or resentment towards this individual because I took responsibility for my side of the street. You know, and I'm free of that one today. And when that happened, though, it, it, it created my pattern for the rest of my drinking and using. And what, what it was is that was taken away from me. Now that was a tool to get what I wanted. See, no longer was it being intimate or making love. It was, I will screw you to get what I want. And, and what happened, you know, I, uh, I went on a, a trip between junior high school and high school. My parents took me back to Greece and Italy to meet some relatives and, uh, and go back there. And for the first time, see, I had dropped some weight because I didn't like the Greek food. So in two weeks, I lost like 20 pounds. And, uh, <laughs> I got to wear my first two-piece bathing suit, you know, and I had all these Italian men swarming all over me because I was an American girl. And this was my first experience, really, with um, any men really liking me. See, because when I had crushes on guys, they didn't look at me as a girl. They looked at me as their buddy. So we, I never had those types of experiences. And needless to say, what happened is, see, I flirted a lot. Once I knew that these people liked me, I started to flirt. And, and back then, you know, in Greece and Italy, it's a whole lot different than it is in California. And, uh, see, they, they will take you into positions and into places that you can't get out of, and you better be prepared to defend yourself, see, because they, they don't have a whole lot of morals and values over there, I found out, you know. And um, I would put myself in these types of bad situations because I was very flirtatious. And, and I loved this affection and attention that I was getting that I always wanted. See, I never got to sit on Dad's lap and be held and be his little girl. I was his tomboy. I went to football games with my dad. I mowed the lawn. I cleaned the pool, you know. So I never got that kind of affection. So when I got it, it kind of threw me on a, on a whirl, you know. And, and I came back, and, and I went to high school, and I found out that the boys liked me in high school because, see, they didn't know my past history. They didn't know about what I was doing in junior high school and elementary school. And um, this is where I started to drink a little because, you know, it was acceptable. You know, it's like the thing to do when you're at high school. And uh, I got into my very first serious relationship. And, and this is where I, I, can, I can look back and I can see, geez, I still didn't know how to deal with my feelings or my emotions. Because, see, when I got angry, it was okay to hit people still. See? And it didn't matter if you were a man or a woman. It was okay to hit you. And, and I found out that men thought it was okay to hit me. You know, that just because I was a girl, it didn't make a difference. And uh, I got into some physical fights with this gentleman, and, and I, was, I was smoking pot and smoking cigarettes and drinking, you know. And um, I got in trouble at school because of it, because not only would I do physical damage to people, I would do physical damage to property. Like, I would kick in all the garbage cans when I was mad. I would try to break windows when I was mad. Um, so I didn't know how to express those feelings. I didn't know that I could just be angry and walk through it and just say I'm angry. I always thought you had to act on that feeling. And... Um, Somehow I got out of that relationship, but uh, my drinking started, you know, and, and, and I did good grades, and I was turning 16 years old, and I, and I was confronted with um, a proposition by my family. And you see, my family love always came with a condition, you know, if you do good in school, we'll do this for you. If you do bad in school, we'll take it away, you know. So I learned that, that you do what you got to do to get what you want. And... Um, my parents said they'd buy me a car and maintenance it for me and pay for all my gas as long as I pulled good grades. So I pulled straight A's. I said, right on. You're going to give me a vehicle that will give me my freedom to do what I want? Straight A's is nothing. You know? And so I pulled them. And, and at this time, I'm, in a, I'm a junior in high school, and it's cool. i got wheels now. See, now i got friends. See, because I drive them everywhere. And, and you see, I, I stole money and shit from my parents. You know? I, they, they'd have 50s and 100s on them, and I wanted to look cool. So I'd have 50s and 100s on me, and I'd buy people. And, and I was always the popular one to hang out with because, well, shit, Amy has money. <laughs> Let's go with Amy. And uh, 
I started to drink and cut school, too. You know, I maintained my grades, but I started to cut school. And, and I hung out with the type of people that were like me. I didn't hang out with puppies. I didn't hang out with them, those other people. <laughs> you know, I hung out with the stoners because they did what I liked to do. And that was part of and it was the only thing that ever made me feel okay. Not even good grades made me feel okay. Not even excelling in things. It didn't make me feel okay. I was very active. I was on swim teams, dance lessons, vocal coaching, uh, piano lessons, soccer. I was involved in all that stuff. And none of it made me okay. You know, and I would take it just so far and finally I'd be fed up and I'd quit. And, and so I started to drink and use with these people and um, we would cut school. And the big thing was for me, as I was 16 years old, we'd have to go shoulder tap, you know, or steal it, it didn't matter. Um, we'd get the booze, and, and we'd go over to this person's house that lived on the Almond and Golf and Country Course Club, you know, on their course. And we thought it was a kick. We'd play quarters, we'd get a little drunk, and the golfers would come by with their balls, and we'd steal them, and hide behind a fence and watch them look for their golf balls. Because they couldn't find them. You know, and we just thought that was awesome. And I ran into somebody I did that to also the other day, you know, when they heard my story. And um, I made my amends then, you know. Um, but you see, that was fun to me. I thought that that was okay. Um, I didn't think that I was creating any harm. I didn't think I was bothering anybody. Um, you know, my very first drunk, drunk, was over being rejected in a relationship. Someone told me that they wanted to end a relationship, but I didn't know how to handle that. My emotions were so intense, and the pain was so great, and I didn't know how to relieve it. I didn't know that I could just talk about it and write about it, and it would go away. You know, I didn't know that, see, when I felt pain like that, it meant it was gonna, I was going to die from it. It was forever. You know, it was so bad, and, and so I decided I was going to cut school and go get loaded, and I did that. And I went up to Mockingbird Park, and I sat there, and I said, I want booze. Who's going to buy it for me? Here's the money. How much do you want? I'll give you what you want. I want booze. And so they left and got me my booze. Well, they weren't there. I, I smoked some joints, see. And then they came back with a fifth of Bacardi, and I drank it within five minutes. Then I also drank a six-pack. Then I smoked another joint. Needless to say, say I sat on a log and peeped my guts out, you know. Um, I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk, I just didn't feel good, you know, and um, what happened was, you know, the next morning, I got to school and everybody just thought it was hysterical, see, I, I got my first hangover, <laughs> and everybody would walk up to me yelling and screaming and saying, how are you, Amy, and it's like, oh my God, not good, you know, and, and that was my very first experience with getting really, really loaded, you know, and you know, I remember drinking that beer and that Bacardi and I didn't like it, I did not like the taste. I did like the effect that it gave me, but I didn't like the way that it tasted. And I'm one of those alcoholics that drank through that until I liked it. You know, I drank enough to where, you know what, Budweiser was cool. <laughs> I like Budweiser. I like Mickey. I like whatever you got, you know. Um, it didn't matter to me. I was like, you know, people bum cigarettes, so I bum booze, you know. <laughs> it was like whoever's there because I was underage. You know, and people would hang out at this park and show up up there after work, and these guys were older than me, and I started to learn that it was better to hang out with people that were older because, see, they could get the stuff. All I had to do was give them money, and they'd go buy it for me, and I didn't have to worry about shoulder tapping anymore. And uh, I hung out with these people, and they'd show up after work, and there's cute little Amy, you know, playing her little flirting routine, and shit, how many beers do you want, Amy? You want a beer? Here's a beer. You know, what, what else do you want? Do you want some cocaine? We'll get you some cocaine. You know, whatever I wanted was readily available for me at 17 years old. And uh, I had some fun. I, I can't say that my drinking was all terrible. I really had some good times. Um, I didn't wake up all the time with a hangover. I didn't black out a lot. Um, I didn't lose anything. I never got married, so I didn't have anything to lose. Um, but my drinking got worse. Um, I didn't realize it until I got sober, but when I graduated from high school, well, before I graduated from high school, I started hanging around bikers because I thought that, that was cool. And, and, see, I was still trying to fit in somewhere. And I thought if I hung out with them, that they would teach me how to be tough. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous about you guys ain't so tough, you know. But I found that some people have, like, the biggest heart that I've ever seen in my life. And it was the people that I thought were tough, you know. And what happened was I hung around these people, and I, and I faked it. I faked it. I put on leather, and, and I tried to be tough. And I walked around using every other word was the F word, and, and I'd fight anybody. And, and 
It didn't matter to me whether you were a man, a woman, if you didn't look at me the right way or you didn't say the right words that I wanted to hear, I was in your face. I didn't know how to keep my opinions to myself. And um, it got me into a lot of trouble, you know. Um, and, and I started to hang out with these people, and I had a really good time. I really had fun. And uh, I also, at the same time, it was almost like day and night, because at the same time, I got lead vocals in a band. And so while I was performing in this band, I was Little Miss Prim and Proper, wearing cute little sequence dresses with the makeup, the hair back, acting the way that I was supposed to act, and then during the day, hanging out with these other people, putting on black leather, thinking I was hot shit. And it didn't make any sense, but you know what? It worked for a while, and, and I did that. And, and I did a lot of drinking and a lot of drugging, and I found out that the music industry, there was a lot of drinking and a lot of drugging involved. And um, I did that for almost a year, and, and when I graduated from high school, I went on a Caribbean cruise for graduation. And uh, I can remember getting on this cruise from the day that I boarded the ship to the day that I got off, I was loaded. I don't think I slept much. Um, I almost slept through my first port. You know, I went to bed about five, got up about seven or eight. Um, I was drinking around the clock, and I thought I was having a really good time. And at the same time, I also brought drugs along with me, you know, so that I could stay up all night long. And uh, I got when I when the cruise was over. My parents wanted me to go to college, and, and I was a people pleaser, too. See, I, I would do what it took to get you to be my friend. And if that meant that I needed to act different, I'd act different. If that meant I needed to talk different, I'd talk different. If that meant that I had to give you all the money in my pocket, I'd do it. Because I wanted your friendship. I was so alone and so miserable inside that I would do anything it took to make a friend. And, and I went to go to college, and I didn't like it. I didn't like the people. I didn't like going to school because the bottom line was I still wanted to party. I still wanted to get loaded. And uh, I talked my way out of it, and I took a full load and dropped out of six classes, I think, within two weeks. And, and I continued to party. And um, it got worse. I started hanging out at Coke dealers' houses. Um, cocaine was really good for me because it let me drink around the clock. It let me stay awake and drink all the time. And uh, I tried school another semester. And it did not work. I did the same thing that I did before. You know, I went into school like they talk about in these rooms, you know, trying the same thing, looking for different results. And I did the exact same thing, and it didn't happen. You know, I dropped out of school again, and I continued to party. And, you know, when I hit 18 years old, I thought I was worldly. I thought I knew it all. And leave me alone, I'm going to run my life. You're, you're just in my way. And uh, I would do things like I was living at my parents' home, and I would do things like, I'm going to go get a pack of cigarettes. I'll be back in an hour. Two days later, Amy comes strolling in the door. You know, I, I would do things like, I'm going to go away to Reno for the weekend, and I'll be back Sunday night. Three weeks later, I'm calling my dad at 4 a.m. saying I'm stranded. You know, and the good codependent that my father is, he bailed me out and flew me home. You know, um, and I had to be reminded of these things. My parents had to tell me because I didn't remember that I did these types of things when I was drinking and using. And uh, somewhere along the line, I got fed up with my behavior, and my parents told me that I needed to get a job or else I was going to be kicked out of their home. And what I did was I got a job working at an answering service for doctors, and I got loaded on my job. We all partied. And uh, today I look at it, and it was really insane. I was, I was answering phone calls at 5, 6, 7 o'clock at night. Some were emergencies, and I was loaded. I'm playing with other people's lives. I'm loaded. I mean, that's insane to me. That is totally insane. And through this, a girlfriend of mine that was 17 years old had gone through a recovery unit and asked me to go to a meeting with her. And I said that I would go. And uh, I went to this meeting, and I didn't have the foggiest idea what it was about. It was I knew it was an AA meeting, but that's all I knew. And, and we walked into this meeting, and I saw people laughing and hugging and kissing and a lot older than me. And I thought there was something really wrong with the picture. You know, I just did not understand. But I sat through the whole meeting, you know, and she stood up and introduced herself. And I was like, what are you doing? Why are you telling these people you're, you're an addict? Now, God, there's something wrong with you. You don't give that up, you know. And, and, and she said, it's just part of what I need to do. And I said, okay. And I just sat there. And she was like, aren't you? No, I don't have a problem. You know, I don't need to stand up. And that was my first experience with Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't even have a clue that I had a problem. 
my second experience with Alcoholics Anonymous was behind um, me getting drunk and loaded one more time and going home and telling my dad to F off. And what happened was when I told my father to F off, he did not react politely. Um, we got into a brawl, you know, and it was the first time that I had really disrespected my father in that way. And we got into a physical fight. And uh, what, what happened behind that was I was so afraid of my father now, I put the blame all on my dad that I needed therapy because I wouldn't go home because I was so frightened of my dad. And I went home finally because I went to counseling and in counseling this lady asked me, she goes, so you're 19 years old. And I said, yes, ma'am. And she goes, well, do you drink? Of course I do. And she says, well, how much do you drink? And I said, as much as any 19-year-old would drink. And she asked me, well, how much is that? I go, a case or more a day, you know. <laughs> and, and she said that that was not normal. And I didn't even know that. I didn't have a concept of that wasn't normal. I thought that was normal. I didn't tell her I did drugs. She just asked about drinking, and that's all I told her, you know. And, and so she told me to go to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, and I said, well, I can handle this. I've been to one before. And, and I went to this guy who had two years clean and sober in his program, and in, in their home, they had the serenity prayer, this plaque. And I remember one night I was totally loaded, and I wrote that down on a piece of paper and put it in my purse because I liked what it had to say, not knowing it was from Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, he took me to a meeting, and it was Saturday Night Live out in Campbell, and it was there. And uh, I sat in a way, way, way back corner because I didn't want no one to see me. And I would not go to a meeting around my parents' home because I didn't want anybody to know. And uh, I sat in the back. And this lady got up at the podium, and she started to talk with long black hair. That's all I remember. And whatever she said hit me hard because I started to cry. And for the first time, I cried. And, and that was not cool where I came from. You're not allowed to cry. So I needed to leave, so I left. And it wasn't too long after that that, that I had a spiritual awakening at about 2 o'clock in the morning and uh, realized that what I was doing was wrong, and I went to my family and told them I needed help. At that time, I also found out that they tried to commit me, and they thought I was insane. And I did not know that. You know, I thought what I was doing was okay. I wasn't bothering anybody else's life. And uh, I went into a place called the Chemical Dependency Institute. And uh, I walked in there with my bags packed, and I got into the detox. And I walked in there with this major chip on my shoulder, acting tough, trying to put this facade on on the outside to keep everybody away from me because I didn't want anybody to find out who I was. And I didn't want to find out who I was because I was too petrified of finding out. And... They took me into detox, and I sat there, and they started to go through my bags, and I panicked. I really panicked. And, I, and like a little kid throwing a temper tantrum, I panicked. And he, he, she told me to calm down, that he had to do this. And he started opening my bags, and I cowered like a little girl in the corner, and they sat down, and I just couldn't believe he was going to do this to me. And what he found was a red teddy bear. And he looked at me and started to laugh. And I said, this is not funny. This is not a funny situation. And, and he goes, yes, it is. Everybody in this facility has one, and it's okay. And for the first time, and that's men and women, not just women, um, for the first time in my life, not taking nothing, I felt part of it. I felt okay. I felt accepted. And, and I stayed in this facility for 28 days, and, and I went in there 19 years old, scared to death. And uh, the first two and a half weeks, I got an $8,400 tan. So all I did was lay out in the sun. I didn't listen to them. I, I, some of the stuff started to sink in. I heard that I had a disease. And I said, yeah, so, you know. And, and, and I was told that, it, that it's called alcoholism. And I didn't take it too seriously, you know. And, and, and I heard some stuff about how the, the, the alcohol affects my body and, and how I'm different than other people when I drink. And I listened to this stuff, and I just didn't take it too seriously until both of my roommates that I had, the first one left this facility, got loaded w within her first day, and was drinking a fifth a day again. The second lady got loaded on the grounds and told the nurses and got kicked out the next day. And when these two things happened, I guess once again I had another spiritual awakening and I woke up. That I realized that I'm now playing with my life. This is my life at stake here. And I got real serious. And, and I, I went to about 180 meetings in the first 90 days of my sobriety, and I got a sponsor, and I started to work the steps. And, and I worked the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and all I did was read out of the 12 by 12 with this lady. And I did a fourth step, and in this fourth step, I never wrote down my piece of anything. It was everybody else, what I presented about everybody. 
And um, I went through all the steps. And it says, after having a spiritual awakening, and I said, this isn't, I don't feel a spiritual awakening. I don't understand. I didn't even understand what a spiritual awakening meant. And, and what I was told is it's a personality change. Well, my personality hadn't changed. I was still walking around cussing and swearing and acting the same way. And you see, I thought that I was going to be able to put down the drugs and put down the alcohol, and my life was going to be better. And what I found out was I put down the drugs and I put down the alcohol, and I still had to contend with Amy. Amy's behaviors didn't change, and Amy didn't change. Amy was still that raw, vulnerable individual now because I had nothing to numb what I was feeling, except men. I had that. Um, in the first year of my sobriety, I went through six relationships, focusing in on them, and I got real sick ones, you know, ones that, that just, I figured I could fix their life, and my life would be wonderful. And, and what that did was, at about nine months sober, it pushed me into extreme pain. I mean, it was intense, and I had never felt pain like this before in my life, and I had absolutely nothing to numb it. And I didn't know what to do. And, and I was told that you have two options. You work the steps or you get loaded. And, and I didn't even have to think twice. I worked the steps again. And I found a different sponsor. And when I found this different sponsor, um, this time I, I had a four step with my piece of the action and things that I had done. And I started to look at Amy's side of the street and started to look at Amy. And, and you know, the first couple years of my sobriety were really touch and go for me because I'd walk into these rooms and look at you people and say, I don't want what you have. Look how old you are. You know, what do I have in common with you? You lost your job. You lost your wife or husband and your kids and your house. I don't even have any of that stuff yet. You know, what do I have in common with you people? And, and I was told that I needed to start looking for similarities and listening to the feelings. And I started to listen to the feelings, you know, and, and I found out, too, at nine day, 90 days sober, that there are still assholes in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, that just because we stop drinking and using doesn't mean that we're perfect. And I, I walked around preaching that AA was wonderful. I told my parents how terrific everybody in this program was until I got used by somebody with seven years. <laughs> and then it kind of woke me up to men are men, women are women, and nobody changes unless they work those steps. Bottom line. I don't care how much time somebody has, you know, and, and I'm not here to judge anybody, but I know for me that I didn't change until I worked those steps thoroughly. And that change didn't occur until I had about four years of sobriety. You know, um, I, I don't suggest for any newcomers that are in here to not work the steps the way the big book tells you to. See, I never had a sponsor that told me how to work the steps the way the book told me to do it. And, and I had to go through what I had to go through. I believe that was what I needed to do. I needed to go through all these different paths and avenues to find out what it was I didn't want. I needed to start to find out that certain things were not acceptable to me anymore today. I learned that it is not socially acceptable to hit somebody. In Alcoholics Anonymous. That's one of the things I learned. I also learned that it is not socially acceptable for me today to get up here and cuss and swear and rant and rave anymore. It's not acceptable. Um, this is for me because for me, see, I lost all those things that I was brought up with, like with values and morals and integrity and dignity and self-love, self-esteem, all that stuff. I lost it when I was getting loaded. And, and I started to learn that I didn't want to live the way I was living sober. I did not come into these rooms to feel the same pain and misery that I felt out there and not have a damn thing to numb it. And uh, I got engaged in Alcoholics Anonymous when I was about 22. Bad mistake. Um, you know, I, I got engaged to somebody who, who was just like me. <laughs> it was a major mistake. And uh, I ended up moving to Hollister. I have a home in Hollister. And um we lived out there, and for the first four months living out in Hollister, I did not go to one AA meeting out there. I did not connect with any people in these rooms, and I didn't do what you people had taught me to do, you know, to get a support group wherever I am. And at about, I guess it was three and a half years sober, I was driving home to Hollister, seeing I got a 45-minute drive, and I got a mind that goes off sometimes. And, you know, that alcohol thinking click, click, clicks back in if I'm not spiritually fit, and it kicked in one night. And I'm driving home, and my mind says, screw it. Let's get loaded. And it sounded good. <laughs> it sounded really good, you know. And, and I'm like, all right. You know, yeah, we got credit cards. We can handle this. We don't need cash. We got checks. No money, but we got checks. We can write them, you know. And everything that I was taught in here that's not acceptable was all of a sudden acceptable, you know. And I was driving, and then my mind said, no, we don't know. We don't want to go that far. Let's drive home and get loaded. That's a good idea. We're safe. No DUIs, no nothing, because I hadn't had one yet, and I would not do well in jail. Um, so I decided that 
I would go home and get drunk. And so I went home to get drunk, and there's no liquor in my home. But what there was was a bottle of cough syrup. Luckily, it was prescribed to me by a doctor who knew I was an addict and alcoholic, and there was absolutely nothing in it to get me loaded, you know. But um, I walked over to that as if it was a bottle of JD, and I chugged the whole thing down. And I sat there, and I didn't get the effect I was looking for. And so the, the next alternative and the next option I had was killing myself. And I hadn't thought about that since I'd been sober. And I didn't want to live anymore. And, and, I, and I'd had enough. And, and I made one phone call. That is what you people taught me, that when I'm hurting that bad, that I need to pick up the phone and call somebody. So I did. And I freaked him out because I had him on the phone for about an hour and a half talking about how I'm going to kill myself. You know, and, and he told me to go out and get to a meeting. I said, you don't understand. If I won't go to a meeting, I'm going to get loaded. I'm not going to make it to the meeting. I cannot leave the house. I need to put the sheets over my head and sleep until tomorrow, and then I'll get up and do something. But right now, I have no capabilities of doing anything. And so I didn't do anything. I, I cried myself to sleep. And I got up in the morning, and the first thing I did was at a noon meeting in Hollister. And I walked into that meeting, and there was this big group of people, and I didn't know anybody. And I walked in, and I didn't care what any of you people thought. And I said, excuse me, I need to talk. They all looked at me, who is this chick, you know? And, and I walked in, and I said, I need to talk. And I started to cry, and I started to get real. And, and I broke down, and I told him what I had done, and I was in fear that I had lost my sobriety. And, and I had this gentleman come over to me with about 14 years of sobriety, and he came up to me, and he hugged me, and he said, honey, you haven't lost it but you're on the verge of losing it. You're in relapse territory, and you need to do something about it. And from that point on, I have been 100% absolutely real in my sobriety. I don't care what anybody thinks of me. I am not here for a social event. I am not here to make friends. I am here for my life. You know, I need to work the 12 steps, and I worked them again, and, and I showed up in this meeting, so I got rid of the fiancé, and my world was devastated. <laughs> And what happened for me was I walked into a meeting one more time. And see, I used to walk around, too, with a smile on my face, making sure everybody thought everything was wonderful in my life. And people would say, how are you? Oh, I'm great. How are you? You know, and I'd laugh and I'd joke. And I'd never let you know that I was hurting. I'd never let you know that I didn't know what to do. I'd never let you know that I didn't understand what powerless meant or unmanageability or spirituality or a lot of these words. I didn't understand what they meant. I'd never tell you that. But I'd get up here and sound good, you know. And for the first time, you know, I walked into the meeting at the Alano Club where I've been hanging out for the past two years, and I started to cry when someone asked me, how are you? And I said, I'm not okay. And a lady came over to me for the first time. Somebody else reached their hand out to me, see, because I never made it real easy for that to happen. And she reached her hand out and said, do you need to talk? And I said, yes, I do. And we went in the back, and we talked, and I told her, this feels like it's forever. This pain's never going to go away. And she goes, how long was your last forever? And I said, about a month. <laughs> she says, Okay. How much time do you have now? And I told her, and she was this forever may last about a week. And I said, all right, I think I can do a week. You know, and, and, she, and I asked her, would you please sponsor me? And she said, yes. And uh, at four years sober, I worked the steps the way that the big book tells you to do it. You know, I, I did my four step. I, I did the people that I resented and the cause and the effect. And then I got down on my knees and I prayed for them. Then I wrote about Amy and look just at me because you see it's my inventory not theirs and I never caught that in the big book before that it's I'm not ripping them apart it's about looking at Amy you know then I did an inventory on fears and man I had some off the wall fears going on in my life and then I got down on my knees after I wrote about those fears and prayed to God to, re to remove them you know then I wrote about my sex conduct that we're not going to talk about and um I got down on my knees and I asked God to reconstruct my, my train of thinking to make it sound and healthy for my sexual behavior. And, and I went to this lady, and I dumped my four-step, and I was petrified. I was totally petrified. Because I think it was the real first, first, real honest four-step I'd done. And, and I dumped this with this lady, and she took notes. Oh, man, I thought I was in school again, and I failed, you know. And uh, when we got done with it, she handed me a piece of paper and said, here are your character defects. I said, what? She goes, these are your character defects, Amy. This is what I got out of what you just read to me. And for the first time that afternoon, I felt whole. <laughs> I was able to love Amy completely, all good, all bad. 
you know, now I knew why I did some of the things I did because, see, I had an ego and anger and, and, and dishonesty and control, and I had all these character defects that I was never aware of. I knew my behavior wasn't right, but I didn't know why I did it. So that made it okay for me to continue to do it until I found out why. You know, and, and I could never find out why until I found out what my defects of character were. And um, I still have them today, but um, I'm able to embrace Amy as a whole individual. The 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, when I did them the last time, gave me the freedom to be a human being. I never had that freedom before in my entire life. It was never okay to feel. It was never okay to communicate. Um, you know, spirituality I never understood. I, I never understood what that meant. A and today, spirituality means for me that, that I need to be giving and not selfish. Spirituality means that I need to um, understand people, not be understood, that I need to give love and not receive it. I need to get out of Amy. That's what my spirituality is about, you know. Um, I believe in, in a power. There is a power of this program that works, and I believe it to be true today. Um, and there's a power when I, you know, I'm driving down the road going to get loaded, and my car ends up at an AA meeting, and that's not me. Well, there's got to be something because I was intending to get loaded. And this power took me to a meeting and had somebody there, especially just for Amy, to babysit me for four hours until I was okay to go home and not get loaded. You know, um, the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous has given me a power greater than myself that I can rely on 24 hours a day every day. You know, there are two things in this world today for me that I depend on, never change, and they never lie. And that's the Big Book with the Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and my higher power. Those things are never going to change as long as I stay sober. They are exactly the way they were written. I don't know how many years ago it was, but it's all the same. See, I change and my perception changes. And I perceive things differently than I used to. Like I go in the big book and read things and see things I never saw before because my perception has changed. And, uh, you know, I've learned that I can depend on people to a certain point. But when I put all my dependence on everybody else, I am going to be let down. And when I'm let down, it really hurts. And then I feel like saying, screw Alcoholics Anonymous. You know? So I have learned for me, since I have gotten real, that I need to depend on that book and the 12 steps of my higher power. Because it never has lied to me. It has never let me down. And it always gives me the solution. You know? Um, my sobriety has, has been terrific for the last year. And... Um, I, I, I always want to stay real. I always want to stay open. I always want to remain teachable. You know, um, you people, on my five-year sobriety birthday, when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I was throwing chairs and ashtrays and cussing, okay? I didn't want any of this unconditional love that you talked about in these rooms. And on my five-year sobriety birthday, I went to a new meeting that I needed. I, I, I got asked to chair. I show up at this meeting. And I was totally overwhelmed with the unconditional love that I received. And it looked like the front room was a florist, you know? I mean, there were flowers and plants and balloons and cards and candy. And I just sat there in awe. I couldn't talk. And I got up to speak, and I couldn't speak. And I had this feeling in my gut that I can't explain to you. But I wasn't looking for it when I came here. It's not what I wanted but I got it anyway. So you people continue to love me and put up with my crap and my attitudes and behaviors until I was able to accept it. You know, um, I do a lot of sponsor work and, and work at the ranch with young kids to try to help them realize that what they have is a disease. That they don't have to do that anymore if they don't want to. And, you know, the first experience I had with unconditional love is, is with a lady that's sitting in here tonight, and it was somebody that I sponsored. And I was down in the dumps and going through crap, and, she would call these messages on my machine like, it doesn't matter how you feel or, or what's going on in your life, you're okay and I love you anyway. It was like, what do you want? <laughs> you know, that was like, what, what's, the, what's the angle? And there was no angle. She was just calling to let me know that she cared. And I got that, you know. I have a fiancé in my life today that's not a mistake. And uh, I get support from him. And I never thought it was possible. And, and it's not about him today. It's about Amy being the best Amy can be and what I can give to him. Not what can I take from you. It's what can I give to him. You know, that's different because I was always a taker. And uh, 
you know, this unconditional love thing that, that I had on my five year sobriety birthday is something, you know, I got up and I spoke and, and, and it lasted maybe seven to ten minutes and I sat down and I didn't say much except wow and I'm, I'm freaked out and uh, I don't know what to tell you guys and it's just that I wasn't looking for this and you gave it to me anyway and uh, I sat down and I had people in that room that got up and spoke I had never heard people talk about me like that before in my life it was always what a bitch she was and you know what she did to me and man do you believe she was doing that crap and and you know what I got? I got, yeah, when I first met Amy, every other word was F, 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 F. And today she stood up and, and she didn't use the F word once and she used love six times. You know, that's incredible. And, and it was like, I was told like I was a miracle. You know, I was told by people that stood that they loved me. And that they've seen the growth in me. And that I was an inspiration to them. Wow. I don't know how to explain those feelings. I don't know how to explain people telling me I'm an inspiration in their life, that I've touched their life. I did not realize that being around these rooms and, and having to walk what I talk touched other people. I didn't realize it until my five year sobriety birthday, you know, and um, I am absolutely ecstatic about being here tonight. I was nervous as hell when I got here. You know, I've never done this before. And, uh, you know, what I've learned in these rooms is you turn it over and you just go for it. You know, you walk through it and you do what you got to do and you keep putting one foot in front of the other and you get through it. And I've learned today that it's okay to be uncomfortable and I can walk through it and, and I don't have to get loaded. Because when I got here, I thought when I was uncomfortable, all I knew was to drink. Well, uncomfortable doesn't last long if I just keep walking through it and do something about it. You know, and, and these intensified emotions and feelings that I, that I had when I got here, I get them every now and then today. But, you know, the miracle of it is, is I work the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and I don't react to them. I don't hit people anymore. I try not to cuss and swear anymore. Um, I want to be the best person I can possibly be and I'm always striving for more. You know? Uh, I want to thank you guys for another day of my sobriety because if it wasn't for the people like you and the unconditional love that you gave to me even when I didn't want it, I wouldn't be clean and sober today. And for that, I'm truly grateful. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.